Hi, my name is Dr. Thomas McGinn, the Executive Vice President for the Physician Enterprise here at Common Spirit Health. Today is Monday, June 6th, and welcome to the five minute check in. So, today we're going to do things a little bit differently. We're going to give a brief overview, as we always do, of Omicron, both in the United States and home in Common Spirit Health. But then we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about long COVID. We're really grateful today because we're going to have two of our national experts joining us for that conversation as we review some of the literature and what's happening with long COVID. So why don't we get started on what's happening with COVID across the United States and here at Common Spirit. New hospitalizations are up approximately 5%, about 3,700. That's an increase from the prior week. And that's on top of a 24% increase we saw just two weeks ago. Notably, adults ages 65 years and older have seen the sharpest increase in rates from 6.7 to 24.3 per 100,000. The current seven-day moving average of new deaths has decreased by 23% compared to the previous seven-day moving average. So overall, it's a mixed message. We're grateful that our mortality rates are down, but hospitalizations are on the rise. Sadly, the United States has passed a devastating milestone with over 1 million COVID-related deaths. This is a stunning number, and it's probably much higher. This means that over 200,000 children lost their primary caregiver. More Americans have died from COVID-19 than in two decades of car crashes or on the battlefields in all of the country's wars combined. While all of you have been working courageously on the front lines we have to double down. We have the tools available to us in our vaccines and our boosters to continue to fight and prevent these unnecessary deaths. Remember that adults 18 and older who are unvaccinated are five times more likely to be hospitalized. And those 12 and older unvaccinated are 17 times more likely to die from COVID. So speaking of tools, we now have new research that takes a close look at long COVID and gives us insight to how we might help patients suffering from long COVID. So now onto our conversation about long COVID. I'm very excited because we have two guests with us today. We have Dr. Ankita Sagar, who is the System Vice President to Reduce Practice Variation. And we have Dr. Renuga Vipakandanan, who is the Chief of Infectious Disease and Associate Professor at Creighton University. So thank you both for joining us today. Um, both of you have treated patients with long COVID and done research and published in this space. So I, this is really uh, the perfect two people to talk to about this issue and this new publication that just came out. Uh, Ankara, why don't we start with you in this publication? It's a meta-analysis. So tell us a little bit about why a meta-analysis and number two, how did they define long COVID? This is one of the most you know, tricky questions is everyone's defining long COVID differently. So when we think of meta-analysis, I want us to think about the fact that it's a systematic review. We're taking many small, small studies, pooling all of their data together with the hope that we can recognize and find statistically significant effects when we think about prevalence or risk factors, um, right. and especially in subgroups. So that's why it's a really important study to make note of. And we also, well, just to remind everybody, we get rid of the junk. We get yes. rid of the crummy articles, right? Okay. Exactly, exactly. And to define long COVID, this is an ongoing conversation. Now, the WHO defines long COVID as within the first 120 days after COVID diagnosis, and the symptom has to last at least 60 days. Now, that's a little, slightly different than how the CDC defines it, which is, symptom arising within 28 days or four weeks of COVID diagnosis. The study sort of used those two parameters at, as bookends. So anywhere from 28 days to 120 days, they were looking at patients with symptoms after diagnosis. So they kind of adopted both. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So Renuga, how did it end up? How many articles became part of their study? And what were the big conclusions in your mind from after bringing all this data together? What did that look like? Yeah, they looked at, a, started with 4,000 studies and narrowed it down to 31 really good studies. And they looked at subgroups of hospitalized patients, non-hospitalized patients, mix of both. And right. overall, what the big takeaway was 43% of the patients um, developed um, long COVID condition. And um, hospitalized patients had a higher chance of having long COVID conditions above 
Yeah, and that was it's a much it's a surprisingly large number. Um, did you find Ankara in the article? What were some of the risk factors that stood out to you um, that you know predisposed people to having long COVID? And, and what did that look like in the article? So one of the things that the study investigators really well was pull all the data and tell us what are the risk factors we should really be concerned about. So age, so older patients, female gender. Um, as well as those who have comorbidities. So when we think about hypertension, obesity, hypothyroidism, those are going to be folks who have a higher risk of developing long COVID. So Renuka, let's talk a little bit about severity and mild COVID in the acute phase and how that relates to getting long COVID. The initial thought was, well, if you're hospitalized and have a bad acute event, you're going to have long COVID. Um, but if you have mild and you don't get admitted, you're not going to have it. Tell us a little bit about what that article told us. Yeah, in this article, if you have mild disease, you had still had a chance of having long COVID, but much at a lower rate, around 33%, compared to if you're hospitalized, you know, you had a severe disease and you're at a higher rate of having long COVID, around 55%. Right. Um, also, what was very interesting is that regionally, we saw a difference in higher rates of long COVID conditions as well. Asia around 55% versus UK around 40, US around 30. And you know, one of the questions that we have to continue to answer is, is it due to therapeutics such as monoclonals and antivirals? Right. The more to come. Yeah, interesting, very interesting question. Ankara, there was an article published in The Lancet that you've mentioned about diabetes and COVID. Tell us a little bit about that. So this was a study that came out of the VA and it looked at 180,000 patients in the VA system. And what they found was they were a certain segment of those patients who developed new onset diabetes or at least were prescribed a hypoglycemic agent after COVID diagnosis for a certain amount of time. It makes us kind of pause and think about patients we see in our clinics every day mm. and whether we should be screening them for diabetes at the time of their visit after COVID diagnosis. Raises some interesting questions. And, and Renuga, last but not least, what, what were the predominant symptoms that were prolonged in, in this article? They looked at 23 different symptoms, but the most common were dyspnea, memory loss, sleep disturbance, and fatigue were the most mm. common symptoms for long COVID conditions. Well, thank you both for, first of all, all the work that you've done in this space with long COVID, both in your clinical care, your research, and speaking about it. And I know we have a lot of work to do to help these patients who will be suffering from long COVID, but I'm confident that you know we're going to do a great job in that space. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for joining me today for this special edition on long COVID, and I'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>